Okay. Sorry about that. I just started the recording. Okay. Um, so, hi, Reese. I'm answering the question for another student, and if you have some questions, let me know. All right. Okay. So, let me log into SNHU, and then I'll share my screen, and we'll look at the rubric for the final project. Thank you. You're welcome. I think it's nice that people are starting to think about the final project rather than waiting to week six. So let's go and learning modules. Uh, where is it? Is it doing module seven? And project two. Sorry, I'm talking to myself. I'm looking for the right rubric. Requirements and rubric. Okay. Okay. Okay, so this is a text-based game. That's what I'm talking to you about. So now I see where the misunderstanding is coming from. Um, let me actually share my screen since I keep saying I'm going to do it and I haven't done it yet. So, and I apologize if you hear my washing machine in the background. Okay. So, I'm sharing my screen, and this is the rubric for your final project. And when it talks about a text-based game, it just means there's no graphical user interface. It's not like you're actually going to see a player on the screen and move that player to the left or to the right. So there's no graphics associated with it. It's what they call a TUI, a text user interface, which is actually a term. Um, and so what you will do is you will use a verbal description. So you'll use text on the screen to describe what's happening, what the user can do next, what they can't do if they try and go someplace they're not allowed to go. So that's what they mean by a text-based game. Thank you. I had no idea that's what that meant. Okay. So it's not about like... Like word game. It's not a word, not game. word game. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the difference. And some people are not as old as me, so they won't have remembered word-based. They won't have remembered text-based games. But that's what this is. Thank you. I'm so sorry. No, there's nothing to be sorry about. Um, it, it's a question. The only, the only wrong question is the one that isn't asked. So always ask questions. Uh, at least in my teaching experience, always ask questions. So we are starting on module three, and we're starting on if-else branches. So what, what are we really talking about here? What we are talking about is the ability to teach a program how to make a decision. This is how you're going to learn to write an algorithm. All algorithms are, are the ability to teach a computer how to make a decision. A specific decision, but a decision. We all make decisions every day. We decide if we're going to turn right or turn left on, the, on whatever street we're on. We decide if we're going to eat an apple or a potato chip. Those are all decisions. And the human brain can make m amazingly complex decisions. Python can't, okay? Python can make very, very simple decisions. And in fact, there's only two possible answers, true or false. That's it. Everything boils down to whether a statement is true or a statement is false. One thing that I see students struggling with when they get to chapter three, and it can kind of be demoralizing, is that they want, students want to ask a question like it would make sense for them to ask a question to their friend. But Python can't understand that. It is too simplistic. So we need to learn how to break down our questions so that you can get a true answer or a false answer. And once you learn that and you understand how to break a problem down so that you can get that answer, 
it becomes so much easier. And while we think in complex ways, Python can't. So oftentimes you have to break down a single question into a series of steps. And that's where if, elif, and else comes along. So the concept of branching is just that. I, I have my code, I'm running through my code, and I come to a decision point. That decision point can go one way, to let's say can go right, or it can go left. But how do we know? Because we ask it a question, or really, we give it a statement. So, and, and there is a specific syntax, and there are specific keywords that go along with this. The keywords are if, elif, and else. Where, where do I see those? This, sorry, I'm scrolling fast here. Um, yeah, so, sorry about that. Um, I'm not seeing where they're actually telling us the definitions. They must have changed this from the last time. Anyway, um, so you have three keywords, if, elif, and else. Those three keywords will be used whenever you make a decision. And by the way, you are going to use the knowledge that you're gaining in Module 3 throughout most of the rest of the class, in fact, through all of the rest of the class. Because from now until the remainder of the class, there is no challenge you will do. There is no lab you will, you will do that does not require an if statement of some sort. So, what am I talking about? Well, let's go down here. Okay, that's why I hadn't gone far enough. Okay, so I need to ask, I need to tell the computer to ask a question, but computers don't understand questions, they understand statements. So what we are going to do is we're gonna learn how to turn a question into a statement using an operator. Um, and what you will see here is just that. We have a variable hotel rate. You know, it's a variable, it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. And then I'm getting user age. Again, it's a variable. We all know about int. We're getting stuff from an input. We're going to make it an int. Then I have this new stuff here. If user age greater than 65. So let's break this statement down for a second. If is a keyword. You can only ever use it as a keyword. You can never use it as a variable, anything else. If is a trigger to Python. It says, I'm about to branch. I'm going to make a decision, and I'm going to run code if it's true, and run maybe different code if it's false. So the way to read anything after the if is user age is greater than, because that's the greater than symbol, user age is greater than 65, true or false. That's how you read that line of code into English. And if you can remember to think about an if statement in that way, so that when you are asking the question, there's only two answers, true or false, it will become much easier. Okay? So that's what this if statement does. And it all depends on what somebody puts in as the user age. Now, this is important to remember because you're going to have a challenge that kind of looks like this a little later on. Somebody has entered user age. Um, and this whether or not this line of code is actually executed depends on the outcome of this line of code. If the outcome is true, we will always go to this line of code and run it. If it's false, this line of code will never actually be run. So let me explain, let me show you what I'm talking about. Let me, I know. Let me create a file and have it tell me I don't have things set up right. And this is simple if. Okay, so I just copied that in there and I'll now have to go set up my Python interpreter. I still don't know why I have to do this every single time. 
The old pie charm did not make me do this. Okay. So, and what's important about this is I want to show you, I want to walk through this code with you. Okay. Okay, simple if. Sorry about the administrivia. So I'm going to just put a break point there because it's important right now that we walk through this in the debugger. So I'm in the debugger. We did this before, but we'll talk about it a little bit about it again. The blue, the, the red dot I put there by simply clicking on the line and I said I want to stop execution of the code. This blue line is where it is currently stopped, where Python, PyCharm has currently stopped. To move to the next line, I step over. So, and then you will see over here under variables, I have a variable called hotel rate. It's type int and it's 55. So now I'm going to step over again and it's waiting because there's an input statement here. It's waiting for me to enter the age on the console. So I move to the console tab and I'm going to say age is 29. Okay. So now I'm on line five. So I entered 29. So we see here on the debugger screen that user age is 29. So the way to read this is the way to read line five right now, right now. Is, is, could somebody mute? Can somebody mute? Let me go out. Let me go out. Let me go out. He's not muted. I'm not muted. Okay. Muted. Muted. Okay, something's wrong because somebody's not muted. Kenny, are you muted? I'm trying to mute because the computer locked up. Oh, okay. I, let's see. Well, I'll do this and hopefully we won't get too much feedback. So, line five again. I'm on line five. I have put in 29 as my age. So the way to read line 5 is, is 29, sorry, let me stop. The way to read line 5 is, 29 is greater than 65. Is that a true statement or a false statement? Since 29 is not greater than 65, it is a false statement. And that is what uh, Python's going to think. It's going to say, okay, this is false. What does false mean to Python? What false means is that nothing inside the if block, and I know that's a new term I just pulled on you, nothing inside the if block is going to be run. What in the world is an if block? The block of code directly underneath the if statement. We know it's inside the if statement because it is tabbed in at least one. So this is currently false. So let's walk over that. You'll see it did not make it to line six. And then it's going to print the hotel rate, which it prints to the console. So now let's do this one more time, but I'm going to change the input. We're going to debug again. I'm going to step over. Uh, it's going to wait for my input. I'm going to put 75. I'm going to go back to the debugger. Whoops, I apologize. I did not hit the enter key. I'm going to go back to the debugger. I'm going to, now I'm at line 5, and my user age is 75. So I'm going to say user age, sorry, 75 is greater than 65. That is a true statement. Because it's a true statement, you're going to see something different than when it was a false statement. This time you're actually going to see it go to line 6. Line 6 is going to take $20 off the hotel rate because I'm 75 now. 
and then it will go and it will go to eight and it will print. So that is what a branch does. The first go round when we were 29, it did not execute line six because we told it not to. And so it branched to the next available line, which was eight. When we said our age was 75, which is greater than 65, it took another branch. The other branch that it took was it went to line six because it was true. And when something is true, it is inside the if block. So now let's deal with that whole inside the if block thing that I pulled on you. Okay? Inside the if block is any line of code that is indented at least one after the if statement. So line six is inside the if block. Now line six is not inside the if block and all of a sudden I have an error. And if I try and run this, I'm going to get an error. And it's going to tell me I have an indentation error. It's expected and indented block. And it's going to do it right here. Because if you use an if statement or an elif or an else, and we're going to get to those, Python is always going to expect at least one line to be indented once. So if I take line six and I hit my tab key, I can now run it without a problem just by hitting that tab key, okay? So if I tab twice, let's see what happens. I'm going to run it, and I'm still fine. So, but for the class and for Zybooks, you want to be very careful about your tabs. Now, can I only have one line inside this if block thing? Well, no, I can have as many lines as I want. So I can say print your old so you get a discount. Okay? And if I run it again, you will see that if I enter 79, now I get your old so you get a discount and the hotel rate is 135. In fact, let's do this. Let's debug it. And I'm going to, oh, I have to go to the console. Yeah. So let's say I'm 79. So now my hotel rate is 55. My user age is 79. If I step over, I'm actually going to go inside the if block and I'm going to take $20 off the hotel rate. Now I'm going to get to a print statement and it's going to say you're old so you get a discount. And then I'm going to print the hotel statement. And so we have these three things here. If I do it again and I say my age is 33, I'm going to say 33 is greater than 65. That's a false statement. So I'm just going to go to line 9. You will see that I skipped over line 6 and 7. And I skipped over line 6 and 7 because 33 is not greater than 65. That's exactly why I did it. Now, there's one something that a lot of students, when they're first learning about if and else statements, they do the first line, but not the second line. So if I run this again, actually let me finish, stop and rerun. If I do this again, and I say my age is 33, all of a sudden I got your old, so you get a discount. Why did I do that? But because I put in 33. Well, that happened because I unindented seven. You'll, you'll remember that I took seven and I backspaced it. Because it is left justified, it's on the same column, column one, in my program, it does not, Python says, well, it's not in the if block. 
So I'm going to run it no matter what. So the only difference I make is to tab it. And when I run it and I save 33, it doesn't come out. So that's what an if block is. And it's run because the result of the if statement is true. It will only ever be run if when you make that statement and, and Python evaluates that statement, it evaluates to true. Does anybody have any questions before we move forward? Okay. So, and I, and I ask that, by the way, just because I'd rather take more time tonight and kind of stop if people have questions, because this is the point where students start to get really, really frustrated, especially students who have never had any programming experience before. So I'd rather take the time now to make sure this, this concept gets locked in so that it reduces the frustration um, and, the, and the amount of time that you end up having to take to really start to learn how to write algorithms. So we're just going to go through and do 3.22 just as an example of how to break down a, um, yeah, just how to break down a problem statement so you can define your if statement. Um, I'm sorry. Before we do this, we're using else here too. So let me go back here and do else. I, I forgot to tell you that about else. So my 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 bad. So excuse me. Um, excuse me. What if you want to do something only if the if statement evaluates default? That's why you use the else keyword. Oh, and by the way. Sorry, I'm doing lots of by the ways tonight. There's some very specific syntax associated with if and else statements. You will see that I just put a colon after the word else. That colon is very important. That colon, when you forget it, can drive people crazy. And I'll show you that in a minute. So what do I want to do if somebody is not over 65? I want to print your young, so no discount. Okay, you'll notice I indented line 9-1 because there's an else block as well. Same concept. If it's indented 1, Python knows to execute it. So what's going to happen here? What's going to happen is if line 5 evaluates to false, the next thing that's going to happen is it's going to end up on line 9 going to end up on line 9 because I put an else statement there. And an else means assuming the if is false, then you do this thing instead. So it's do lines 6 and 7 if line 5 evaluates to true. Otherwise, do line 9 if it evaluates to false. But if line 5 evaluates to true, it will never do line 9. So let's debug this one more time. I'm going to put in 33 again. So 33 is not greater than 6, so line 5 evaluates to false. Now what's going to happen is I'm going to go to line 9, and it's going to say you're young, so there's no discount. And then I'm going to print 11. So now let's see what happens when I put in 79. My age is 79. 79 is greater than 65. We saw this before. So I'm going to go to line 6. Python's going to execute it. Python's going to execute line 7. It is not going to execute line 9 because I entered the if block because line 5 evaluated to true. Instead, I'm going to go right to line 11. So that's what we call mutual exclusion. 6 and 7 will be run always if 
5 evaluates to true. Line 9 will not, not be run ever if line 5 evaluates to true. If line 5 evaluates to false, 6 and 7 will not be run ever. And if, and, and excuse me, and line 9 will be run. So that's if else. They're mutually exclusive and they are always based on what happens in the if statement. You cannot have an else without an if. Can't do it. Python will not allow you. So let's see what some errors look like. First of all, I was talking about that colon because what you have is you have the keyword, then you have the expression because that's what that's called. Then you have this little colon. That little colon is like a question mark to us. We know that the question ended because we see the question mark. Python knows that the, the uh, if statement has ended because it sees the colon. So what happens if I remove it? Well, if I remove it and I try and run, I'm going to get a syntax error, invalid syntax. Now, Python is not going to tell you that you forgot a colon ever. Um, programmers that write programming languages are notoriously bad at giving error messages. <laughs> and I know that because for a while I wrote a programming language, a proprietary obscure programming language, but it was still a programming language. So, um, so how do I fix this? If you have an if statement and you're getting syntax, invalid syntax, most likely it's because you forgot the colon. So I run it I, because I added the colon and it runs. So now what happens if you just put an else there and you don't put an if? So I'm just going to delete this for a second and I'll undo it. If I try and run it, I get syntax error, invalid syntax. Doesn't tell you anything about why you did it wrong. And Technically, there's nothing wrong with an else statement, but the problem is in context, you don't have the if. So you have to have the if statement. They go hand in hand. You cannot have an else without an if. You can have an if without an else, but not the other way around. So how do we take a word problem and turn it into an algorithm? Because that's really what we're starting to do here. Um, so what it's saying is write an expression that will cause the following code to print 18 or less if the value of user age is 18 or less. Write only the expression. Okay. So they give you everything here. And it's if your solution goes here, print 18 or less, else print over 18. Well, we've just done something very, very similar to that. Okay. So here, what this would be, is, okay, 18 or less is less than 18. Sorry, less than or equal to 18. Uh, they haven't gone through the operators yet. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that in a minute. So um, let's just do this from scratch. 3, 2, 2. Okay, so we're just going to take this one from scratch. I know it's simplistic, but it's a good way to start thinking about a how to write an expression. And I'm just going to do it from, well, let's just do all of this. Okay, make this a comment. then this is what they give you. So they're giving you most of the program. And the trick here is to determine what the operator is because that's how you can create a statement. So they've asked us if the value of user age is 18 or less. So 
we have some operators. We have equal, equal. We have less than or equal. So what we're going to do here is we're going to use the less than or equal operator. Um, and the statement is simply going to be user age because we have to have for a statement, you have to have a left-hand side of the statement and a right-hand side of the statement because you're always comparing two things. It's, you're always going to be comparing one thing to another thing. You can string those together into the longest this statement in the world, but you're always comparing two things. So I need a left-hand side on the operator and a right-hand side. So my left-hand side... is going to be user age. And my right hand side is going to be what? Well, let's go back and look at what the problem said. The problem said if the value of user age is 18 or less. So my right hand side is going to be 18 because that's what the problem told me it needed to be. And my comments are irritating me. Okay. Oh, uh, wait a minute. Right hand side. What did I do? Oh, that's what I did wrong. Okay. And I also can't spell. So now we have an operator. So we have a left hand side and a right hand side and an operator. So the operator always goes in between. And in this case, the operator is going to be less than or equal to. So I have the three components that make up a statement. So how do I write this in Python? I've written it in words. I understand that there's a left-hand side to the operator, a right, sorry, a left-hand side, an operator, and a right-hand side. Well, to write that in Python, I use my variables, my values, and my operators. So the variable on the left-hand side is user age. The operator is less than or equal. And the right-hand side, is the value 18. So that is how I came up with that if statement based on this particular expression. So it's going to be user age is less than or equal to 18 because left hand side is the variable, then you have an operator, then you have a value or another variable because you will compare variables to variables. And if I run this and I put in 17, oops, because I'm not telling it to run, sorry, I didn't change this to run the right program. Okay. And I'm sorry, but I'm sure we're going to go over tonight. I hope that's okay with everyone. Okay. So I'm going to put in 17, and I get 18 or less, which is what I expect. So let's keep going and more else, L if statements. You can nest else and if statements. So you can have an if with another if with another if. You can nest them and nest them and nest them. You can combine them. Um, and this is where you start to get into being able to write more complex algorithms. Um, you start, you know, if A. And then if it's A, then you're going to do C, D, and E. And if it's not A, you're going to do X, Y, Z. Um, and you can make another determination um, based on a determination you've already made. So let's go down and look at a challenge. Multiple if statements, printing car features. So I know I'm doing more challenges than I normally do, but... I think it's kind of important this time. And I'm not going to give you the answers to the labs, but for a couple of challenges, I think it's important. Okay. So this is, what is it? Challenge 332. Okay. Okay. So this is, what they're telling us to do. So you're going to write multiple if statements. If your car is 1969 or earlier, print few safety features. If it's 1970 or later, 
print probably has seat belts if it's 1990 or later. Print probably has anti knock brakes. I'm not going to do all of these, but I'm going to get you started. So I have all these if statements. Um, and each phrase with a period and a new line. Okay. So what am I going to do? Well, first I'm going to have to get in the car year. So I'm just going to say car year. It's going to have to be an integer. And then based on car year, so car year is my variable, so it's the left-hand side of my statement. I'm going to say if car year, and it this first line says is 1969 or earlier. So that would mean that, it, that the number is less than or equal to 1969. So my operator is less than or equal, and my value is 1969. Always remember your colon. And then I'm going to print... I'm just going to copy it, few safety features, few safety features. And they said end with a period and a new line. Print will end with a new line anyway. Uh, okay. So now what do I do? Well, uh, these are going to be mutually exclusive. So we've talked about if, we've talked about else. Now I'm going to introduce something called elif. So this is in between if and else. So an elif is else if. That's how you can read it. If it's not 1969, then maybe it's 1970 or later. So again, the left-hand side of my, my statement, my expression, is going to be car year. And it's going to be 1970 or later. So it's greater than or equal to 1970. Then what am I going to do? So I finish this. And I'm going to print probably has seat belts. So print probably has seat belts. So now, okay, I've done an else if. But let's take a look at this. Now it says if it's 1990 or later. So what do I do here? Well, um, if it's, I've, I've already said that if it's, it's 1990 greater than 1970, well, yes, it is. So if I put in 1990 right now, I'm going to hit probably has seatbelt. Let's just run this and go through this a little bit. So I'm just going to change this now. And I'm walking us through this on purpose because this is part of the thought process. Okay. So I'm going to run this. And I'm going to put in 1990. So it says right now that it probably has seat belt. So what can I do here? Well, I can do a couple of things. One of the things I'm going to do is say, the greatest number that I have is 2000. So rather than start with 1970, I'm going to look at the greatest number because I'm doing greater than or equal. So I will say LF car year. So again, we know that the left hand side of our statement is car year, that it's greater than or equal to 2000. Whoops, not 200, 2,000. And I'm going to print, probably has airbags. OK? So now you'll see what I did. I decided to rearrange the problem statement to meet my needs. Because now, if I put in, well, let's do the next one, 1990. So we're just going to say LF car year is greater than 1990. Yeah, it's going to say probably has anti-lock brakes. 
So now we'll see that if I put in 1990, I don't get to the 1970 stuff. So if I say 1990, it's going to say probably has anti-lock break. So even though this is given to me in a specific order, it doesn't mean the order that the problem statement is in logically makes sense for the solution. This solution made sense because we were using greater than or equal to. The initial if is if it's less than or equal to 1960, just print this and be done with it. The other ones made more sense to start with the larger number because we were using greater than or equal to. So let's keep going. So here's all of our operators. I have just started talking about less than or equal to, like greater than or equal to. There's a whole series of operators that you can use with these statements. They're called Boolean operators, and they mean something very specific. These tables are your friends because they will tell you how it will evaluate. So double equal is equivalent to, is equal to. You know how when I'm talking about variables, I say we know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign? That's why I use the word single equal sign. Because here we have a double equal sign. A double equal sign means equivalent. Uh, is the thing on the left-hand side? Same as the thing on the right hand side. If the thing on the left hand side is the same as the thing on the right hand side, it will be true. It will always evaluate to true. If the thing on the left hand side is not the same as the thing on the right hand side, it will evaluate to false. And that's pretty much what this table is telling us. It says if you assume that x is 3, so it says 3 is the same as 3, that's true. 3 is the same as 4. That's false. So that's what it's telling you. And, and basically, you can always evaluate every operator to true or false, every single Boolean operator. So just like we have is equivalent to, we have the opposite, which means it's not equivalent to. Opposite in Python is the, uh, is the exclamation mark. So if you see exclamation equal, it can read not equivalent to or not the same as. And that will always evaluate to the opposite of the double equal sign. And then we have our relational operators. So is it greater than, is it less than, is it greater than or equal to, is it less than or equal to? That's what these are. Less than is the left angle bracket greater than is the right angle bracket, and then you have less than or equal to and greater than or equal to. If you start to have questions how they evaluate, come back to these tables. Let's keep going. Operators and expressions. We already talked a little bit about an expression. And um, so the Boolean, about, Boolean refers to true or false. That's it. It can be two things. So here are a set of tables that talk about and and or and not. Okay, so we just looked at is equivalent to, is not equivalent to, is greater than, is less than, greater than or equal to, and less than or equal to. That's great. Now you can add these things up. You can have compound statements. And a compound statement can become a little bit confusing, especially for new students, because when it depends on how you're combining your expressions. When you combine an expression and they are both, they both evaluate to false, it's always false. If one evaluates to true and one evaluates to false, or one evaluates to false and one evaluates to true, it's always false. You will find out when you are programming complex expressions that if there's even one false in the expression, if, it, if one part of the complex expression evaluates the false, the whole thing evaluates the false. If you're using an and. If you're using an and, so I'm saying this and that and the other thing, 
then you know that the only way to make it true is for everything to be true. If you're using an or, this or that or the other thing, the only way to make it false is for everything to evaluate the false. So we're going to go and look at some of those. Now, right here is just a couple of examples, just making this big so it's easier. X greater than 0 and Y less than 10. Evaluates true because X is 7 and Y is 9. So this is it's pretty self-explanatory for this table. Go back and take a look at it when you're doing your uh, challenges in your lab. Um, and, um, and, and kind of get this, um, even print it out and look at it while you're trying to write com the complex statements that you're going to write. It's very important to understand the difference and how these work together. Okay. Membership and identity operators, in and not in. In and not in are really nice because they are used to, basically they're used to say, is this value in this list? Now, we're not going to do a lot of this right now because when we are going to do this is when we start to do lists. So I'm mentioning it here, but... Um, it's not something that we're going to spend a lot of time concentrating on. It, it is very handy, but because there are, li there are lists, and we're not really going to be dealing with a lot of lists until the next module, I think that I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it right now. Order of evaluation I am going to spend time on. Just like you have order of precedence in math, you have order of precedence in Boolean operators. One uh, one, one, the change of one operator can change how the expression works, especially for parentheses. So if things are not evaluating the way you would expect them to evaluate, you need to go back and look at the order of precedence. Okay? For example, a less than is always going to evaluate before a less than or equal to. Who knew? I wouldn't know if I weren't going back and reading this table, okay? So this is another table to keep close while you're writing your expressions. When in doubt and you want something to, to, to be evaluated first, put parentheses around it. Code block and indentation. We've already talked about code blocks and indentation. Conditional expressions. Um, so we've pretty much talked about conditional expressions as well. That's what the simple if and the LS. Um, this is practice for a tweak decoder, so lab. So the smallest number. So we're going to kind of go over these. Of course, I'm not going to give you the answers, um, but please ask any questions if um, you have any at this point. Put them in the chat, raise your hand, say something. Um, so 3.11 is write a program whose inputs are three numbers and whose output is the smallest of the three values. So you're going to have three variables, okay? And because they're all going to be three separate user inputs, they're going to be integers. And then what do you do? Well, you're going to check one against the other. And in this case, we would be using, uh, if you're looking for the smallest, you're going to be using less than. So if, um, yeah. So let's just go through something. Well, I'm thinking. Hold on. Um, Let's let's talk through this one, and then we might go through one of the other ones a little more closely. This is going to use the less than or less than an equal operator. You guys have to decide because what happens if you put in a 3 and a 3? Because 3 is not less than 3, but it is less than equal to 3. Um, you're going to have three input values, and you're going to check those input values against each other, but you only need two checks. 
You don't need to check everything against everything else. You need to do one check. I think you'll have three checks. Um, but you don't need to check every permutation. So you're going to have an if. You're going to have at least an ellis. Um, and then print out the smallest number. Seasons. This one is a little longer and a little more difficult. So this one is write a program that takes a date as input and outputs the date season. This requires some work with if and else and combinations of things. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of this one. Um, yeah, so we're going to do a little bit of this one. And I know we're going to go a little late, and I hope that's okay. So okay, let's do this. Okay. So I'm just going to copy this all as a big comment. Okay, so let's talk about what it's telling us right now. What it's telling us is that it wants you to write a program that takes dates as input and outputs the dates season. The input is a string to represent the month and an int to represent the day. So you know you're going to have two input statements, okay? So, and it tells you if the input is April 11th, then the output is going to be spring. Now, you're also going to have to check whether somebody is giving you valid input. If they're telling you the day is 107, then we know it's not a valid input because the most there can possibly be in a month is 31 days. And then they give you this information for the season, okay? So spring is March 20th to June 20th. Summer is June 21 to September. Autumn is blah, blah, blah. So let's talk about this and do a little bit of playing around with the code. So first I'm going to have to have two inputs. I'm going to have date, day, let's do day. So the first input is going to be day, and the second input is going to be month. Okay? So when I input the day and I input the month, what's the first thing I have to do? The first thing I have to do is check if it's valid. Okay? So I'm going to write an if statement, and I'm going to say it's going to be a compound if statement. Um, let's just, you know, check this out. Let's just start. We'll just check it for the month. And then you guys can check it for the day. I'm going to say if, well, we have those in operators. That will be easier. I'm going to go back and I'm going to, I'm going to backtrack on what I said because we're actually going to need those in operators for this. Okay, we're going back here, and I apologize for backtracking. Membership and identity operators, we need these right now. We have in and not in. That lets us know if something is inside of a list. We know how to create a list. We don't know how to do a lot to a list yet, but we know how to create a list. So let's look at the months. So I'm going to create a list, and that list is going to be months, and I'm going to say January, February, March, and you guys get the picture. So this is where I'm going to use that in operator. So to check if it's valid, to check if the month is valid, I'm going to say 
if months in months, sorry, if months not in months, then I'm going to print something like invalid. You guys decide what you're going to print. So because we do things in baby steps, we are going to try and run this. So for right now, I'm just going to put in a day of 25. And we're only checking the month, so we're only going to see this dealing with the month. So I'm going to put a month in as blue, and it printed invalid. And that's because... It blue is not January, February, March, or April. So that is how you check if it's valid. And then you're going to have to check if the day is valid. Okay, so if I put in a date of 65, I'm going to have to say, hey, wait a minute, is day valid? By the way, if it's invalid, then you have to kind of stop the program. Okay? So that is something to take a look at. You may want to change the order of things if you're going to stop the program. So now let's do a quick example of spring, summer, autumn, and winter. So spring is going to have March through June. Okay? So there's different ways of slicing this. But if I say, uh, let's see, Spring is March, oops, March, April, May, and June. Now, assuming everything's valid, I can basically say if month in in spring print spring so i'm going to run this again and i'm going to say 22 and i'm going to say march and it says i'm in the spring so let's see if i run it and do something that's not in the spring. So I'm going to say 22. I'm going to say January. And nothing happened. Nothing printed out because it wasn't in the spring. So now you, that this is how you start. This is how you use the in operator. I'm not going to do any more. This is how you start. So once you have all of your seasons, you then have to deal with the fact that you have now date ranges for those seasons. So, if the month is March, is March in the spring, based on not only the fact that March is in the spring, but there are dates involved. So, if I put in March 19th, I'm in the winter. If I put in March 20th, I'm in the spring. So, those things need to be taken into account, but this is kind of the basis and the things that you need to start this lab. Okay, sorry for the aside there. That's why they were telling us about the end. All right. Smallest number we talked about, lab seasons. All right, let's go to the last one. Exact change. Exact change can be maddening because, for me, I always forget in Python about the floor operator. I don't remember about the floor operator. So in this particular... Uh, lab, you have to use the floor operator because it will tell you what you need. So basically, you're writing a program with total change amount as an integer input, and you're going to output the fewest coins that you can. So let's say I put in 110. So I'm going to print out it's a dollar and a nickel. If I put in 125, I'm going to say it's a dollar and a quarter. If I put in 150, I'm going to say it's one dollar and two quarters. So that's what they want you to do, or actually it'll be, sorry, one dollar, two quarters. That's what the output will be. So that's what they want you to do here. 
and you have to use the floor operator to do this properly. So basically, you, and you need to check your margins. You need to check what we call the edges. So if they put in, if they put in zero or less, they're going to say no change. It's a negative number, anything like that. So the first check you're going to do, the first if statement, is going to be if the user input is less than or equal to zero, print no change, and you're done. Or you could say, well, I'm not going to confuse the issue, sorry. Um, if the input is 45, you're going to say one quarter and two done. So how do you do that? You use the floor statement. So I'm going to just do a couple of examples of how to use the floor statement. Floor. So let's go out and do what I do oftentimes. I look at Google. Okay. So I'm going to go and I'm going to say Python. Py. I can spell Python floor operator. Floor division. So this is something, and we did talk about the floor operator very, very briefly in module one. But this is how you're going to use the floor operator. The floor operator basically says, give me the whole number back. Okay? So I, and, and here's the example. If you divide 5 by 2, you get 2.5 back. If you use the floor operator, so if you, div, if you say 5 floor operator 2, you get 2 back. So you only get a whole number back. There's no fractions. There's no decimal places. So, excuse me, that way you can do something like this. So if I say money... And I'm going to say 150, okay? And then I'm going to say, let's see, uh, So what I can do is I can say amount is equal to money dollars. Sorry, I can't, I'm not being very creative with my variables tonight. Is money, use the floor operator, 100. So in this case, if I print dollars, let's see what happens. So I need to change that. Four. So if I run this, oh, sorry, I ran it. I get one. Let's debug it for a second. So it's a little clearer. So I have money, and I have 100, and I have quarter, which is 25. So I say dollars, floor, 100, and I get one. I really didn't need to debug this, did I? So I'm going to print out one. So now how do I know what the next thing is I want to do? Well, in this case, what I want to do is I'm going to say amount is uh, going to be, sorry, um, money minus dollars times 100. I'm going to print amount, and we can see that now we have 50, okay? So I created dollars So by dividing money by 100. So I know I have one unit that is 100. And I printed it out and 
But now I want to figure out how much I have left. And to do that, I have to subtract the number of dollars that I have from the amount of money that I put in. And I do that by simply doing a subtraction. And you'll notice I put my parentheses around here. So now I can then say, let's just say remainder, is going to be um, amount floor quarter. And I'm going to print remainder. And if I run it, you'll see I have two. So this is the basis of that, um, of that lab. You have to use the floor operator. You have to figure out how many times a dollar will go in to the amount of money that you have. If it's none, then you don't print anything. If it's something, then you print the number of dollars. And this is how you get the number of dollars. Then what do you do with the next one? Well, what you do with the next one is you figure out how much you have left, and then you divide your next largest amount by, sorry, you divide that amount by the next largest denomination. And you get the remainder, and you go until you don't have any denominations left. So that is the idea between, sorry, with 3.13. Anybody have any questions? Oops, there is one. There we go. Okay, I'm glad that um, you guys have what you need. Please, um, if you're in my class, if you get frustrated or stuck, reach out to me. All right? This stuff, this is where things start to get complex, but if you take it slow, if you take it baby steps, it will become easier. So unless anybody has any questions, I'm going to call it, and I will hopefully have this up tomorrow for my class, and I'll send the announcements out for um, to the other professors. Okay. I hope everybody has a great, uh, a great rest of the night, and um, I will hopefully see you next week. Thank you. No problem. Good night. Good night.